Well, good morning, Braveswood. We want to welcome you to our online service this morning. We're so glad that you're joining us. And we want to open with a word of prayer. Would you join me right there in your homes? And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your house and to worship you. Even though your house may be our own homes right now, we know that you're everywhere. And so for those that are have felt comfortable to come back to our services, we're so thankful to them our, our, for, being, for being able to come. And for those who haven't felt comfortable, then we're just so glad that they're joining us online. And we just pray that the next 60 minutes would be a blessed time. Lord, that uh, there would be a wonderful time of praise and worship, that you would anoint Pastor James and the praise and worship team and the musicians, Father. Lord, that you would anoint Pastor Steve as he brings us your word of encouragement. Father, we pray, especially for our fathers today, Lord, that you would bless them. Let them know how loved they are, Father. May everything that's done and everything that's said be pleasing to you and according to your plan and purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's praise the Lord together. Yeah. Freedom to walk in 
Thank you, Lord, for freedom to praise your name, Father. We declare freedom in this place today. Freedom to dance and freedom to praise. Freedom to lift your name high, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, you came. You came to set the captives free. You came to bring us liberty. You came to bring us liberty. My sin and my rejection. My sin and my rejection met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, every chain broken through you, Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is covered every sin. Oh, your grace. Your grace empowers me to make. Whoa, my pain and my oppression. My pain and my oppression met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. surround every home, Father, with your glory, Jesus, as we worship you this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. 
where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Oh, oh. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. Your breath. 
Father, we declare that there is nothing like your presence, Lord. Lord, you overwhelm us with your glory, Father. We come to give you all the praise and the honor in this place. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Happy Father's Day. Welcome to Brazewood Church. Relaunch 2020 online. So glad that you're here, especially on Father's Day, the greatest holiday you'll find on the calendar anywhere. Well, maybe equal to Mother's Day. I would acknowledge that. We're so glad that you're here with us. And, and can I just say to you dads, welcome. It is always good to know that there are dads, fathers who love the Lord and are committed to God in every way. I, I want you to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 18 as we study the word this, this morning and, and just a, a word, I, I, a, a word of wisdom for godly fathers, a, a word to you. Now, mothers, you can listen. Children, you can listen. Those of you that are single, can, everybody can listen in because I really believe that though this is directed to the fathers today, it really applies to each and every one of us. Because the word always applies to every single one of us in our life. I want to share with you some amazing statistics about the importance of the Father. Uh, now, first of all, let me say, even before I begin, that God is not restrained because of statistics. He's not. There is nothing that controls our God. But these are some things that Robert Tuttle studied and I think bring to us the importance of what a father's place in the home really is. You see, this study reveals that if you lead a child to Christ, over 30, there's over a 30% chance that the whole family will come to Christ. Now, that in of itself is amazing. A child can bring their family to Jesus. Now, on the other hand, if you lead, lead a mother or wife to Christ, over 17% chance that the family will come to Jesus. That also is an amazing statistic and tells of the importance of the influence of the mother. However, if you lead a father or a husband to Christ, there is a 91% chance that the entire family will come to Jesus as well. 91% chance that the entire family will come to the Lord. Now that doesn't mean that the father is more important. It simply means that the influence of the father is significant. An influence of a father in his spouse's life, an influence of the father in his children's life is absolutely significant. And I want to encourage you dads that you make a difference in your family. You make a significant difference in the life of your family. Now, being a father is a choice. In fact, everything we do in life is a choice. We choose what we will become. Men, women, children, every one of us, we choose what we will become. And the sum total of our choices will dictate who we are and what we are. But I want you to hear me this morning. Many a man can be a sperm donor, but it takes a special man to be a father. A father. What a, what a special title that is for a man to have. Father. And we understand that God calls himself Father. He is our Father, our Father who art in heaven. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, it says, This day I call the heaven and the earth as a witness against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. This is the choices that we have. God says, I have given to you the choice that you either have life or death, your choice, blessings or curse, and again, it's your choice. And I would ask you, Dad, I would ask every listener today, what do you choose? Do you choose life or do you choose death? Do you choose the blessings of God or you do, do you choose the curses that come along with sin? But then the scripture didn't leave it there. As though God wanted to be clear of what his desire of choice for us would be. He goes on to say, now choose life so that you and your children may live. It's as though he didn't even want us to possibly make the wrong decision, the wrong choice. And he adds at the end of that verse 19, now choose life. And if you choose God, friend, 
<laughs> you will always choose life. But not only for you. Dad, when you make those decisions, it doesn't only affect your life, it affects the life of your children as well. And I might add, not just the life of your children, but the life of your grandchildren. And your great-grandchildren, if God would so bless you. If you, Father, choose life, then your children will have and choose life as well. Josh McDowell said, The greatest thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Now, right about now, I can hear every mother saying, Amen, hallelujah, praise God, yes. Preach it, pastor. Let me read it again. The greatest thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. And the greatest thing a mother can do for her children is to love her husband. You see, we demonstrate what love is. We teach our children what love is, not just by telling them what love is, but by showing them what love is. Father, Dad, give your children a great gift. Love their mother. And Mom, give your children the greatest gift. Love their father. Now, think about this. If a father loves the mother, and if the mother loves the father, then the children will grow up not know, only knowing what love is and experiencing love, but with the example Male children with the example of a father loving the mother and, and the daughters with a mother loving the husband and, and, and the, the, the male children learning what to look for in a wife and a female learning to look for in a husband. It, it just, it's a cycle. It just goes around and around and blesses everyone that it touches. Let's read our text, Genesis chapter 18. We read two verses, verses 18 and 19. Abraham, the Bible says, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. And God said, for I know him. Then it goes on. And he will direct his children and his household after him and keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Now I want us to look back and, and verse 19 says, God says of Abraham, for I know him. I want you to know, Dad, God knows you. God knows you so well. In fact, I believe that God knows you better than you know yourself. And, and knowing all of that, we, would, we might presume, well, if God knows me, and if God knows all about me, how in the world could he love me? Let me tell you how he could love you. He loved you because he chose to love you. And it pours out his love into your life every day, regardless of the fact you have weaknesses, regardless of the fact that you have failings, regardless of the fact that you're not perfect, God still loves you. And when he was speaking of, of Abraham, he said, all of these things will come to pass because I know Abraham. I know Abraham will do what is right. I know Abraham will lead his children in a righteous way. And I believe today, Dad, God is looking for you to do the very same thing. And then as we are faithful to the Lord and committed to God in every way that we possibly can be, we have this promise, the Lord will bring about all that he promised to you. The, the, the deep things that he promised to you, the, the rhema word that he brought into your life as you studied and read and prayed and sought the Lord. God spoke into your heart. And I want you to know, the Bible says that he who promised is faithful. So I'm going to give some words of wisdoms to dad. I'm a, I'm a dad and I'm also a, a granddad. I'm a, I'm a daddy, I'm a father, and I'm a papa. And, and, and so these words are not only words that I would give to you, but words that I would take to heart myself, that, that I would make my own. I would make these words mine, possess them and live them as best that I can. Words of wisdom for dad. Number one, dad, be an example. I think that is so very important. Be an example. Our children are watching us. And I don't say that to cause us to any kind of paranoia or fear. They're watching us. And can I tell you, Dad, that they're watching you when you succeed. They're watching you when you're strong. They're watching you when you're weak. And they watch you when you fail. And when you're weak and when you fail, they're watching how you respond to that. How, how you respond when you fail, when you sin, when you respond inappropriately in some way that you're willing to say, I am sorry. 
I am sorry. And then pick yourself up and continue to walk in the faith that God has called you to walk. Clarence Buddington Kindled said, my father didn't tell me how to live. He lived and let me watch him do it. What powerful words those are. He didn't tell me how to live. Now, I think that's important to tell our children how they ought to live, to speak the word into their life. But perhaps what is more important is that he watched them, watched the children, watched him actually live, actually conduct his life and lived as God had called him to live. I want to encourage you, Dad, let's give our children an example, example to emulate. An example, uh, uh, put it another way, a target to shoot for. That, well, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 in the message version says, keep open house, be generous with your lives, be opening to others. You'll prompt people to open up to God, his generous Father in heaven is we give our children an example to shoot for. My dad was, still is, my hero. He's in heaven today, rejoicing in heaven, I'm sure. And, and can you only imagine what Father's Day is like in heaven? Uh, be, gathering around the throne to, for our heavenly Father? But my, my dad was, was my hero. And my dad gave me something to shoot towards. Now my dad's idea was not that I would be limited by his life, but that he gave me an example and, and gave me the encouragement to go above and beyond anything that he could do. And I pray and I hope that I've been at least somewhat successful in doing that. Not to please my dad only, but to please my heavenly father. Some more words of wisdom for dads. Set the values of your children. Set the values of your home. And by that, I don't mean earthly values. I mean kingdom values. Let the values of God's heart be the values of our own heart. Not only communicating the values, but living those values before our children. Making sure that they understand what is important. I might ask you, Dad, what's important to you? Is your job important? Certainly it is. Are, are possessions important? <laughs> I'm sure they are. But are they the most important things in life? Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said, when I was 14, my father died. I missed everything about him. He taught us that we shouldn't be people of success, we should be people of values. Because that is, what the, that is the only thing that endures. Not people of success, but people of value. I believe with all of my heart that if we commit ourselves to biblical values, to kingdom values, I believe with all of my heart, we'll be successful. Now, we may not be successful in the eyes of the world, but you'll be successful in the eyes of your children. And I'm not sure there's anything more important than that, that our children will see the value that we place in attending services, in reading the Word of God, the value we place in prayer, the value we place in encouraging our brothers and sisters the value we place in worship, so many things that there are displayed in the kingdom values in life. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 9 and 11 says, God will form you as a people holy to him, just as he promised you. If you keep the commandments of God, your God, and live the way he has shown you, all of the people of the earth will see you living under the name of God and will hold you in respectful awe. Not only the people of the world, not only the people around us, but your children as well, if we keep the commands of our God. And not only keep his command, but live in the way that he has shown us. The beautiful thing is Jesus taught us that. Jesus demonstrated for us what it was to have that commitment to values, godly values, heavenly values in life. Show your children the things that have true value many of which that cannot be held in our hands. Many things that are valuable you'll never be able to possess. You'll never be able to claim these are mine. Never be able to put them in a bank or in a closet somewhere. But nonetheless, the most important values of life. Ruth Wrinkle said, sometimes the poorest man leaves his children the richest of inheritance. My grandmother Banning Alice Banning, when she and Grandpa Banning died, they desired, it was in their heart, 
to leave a thousand dollars to each one of their children. They were not rich people. They were not rich in the earthly riches. But they were rich in heavenly riches. But they desired to leave a, approximately a thousand dollars to each one of their children, nine living children. When Grandma Banning passed away, when she left this earth for her heavenly reward, she was able to leave approximately one thousand dollars to each of the living children. Now, all of her children were successful in their own way. All of their children were successful ultimately in serving God with an inheritance that was greater, uh, priceless compared to a thousand dollars. Yet, that was in her heart. She and Grandpa Banning left an inheritance that not only touched our family, but has touched generations and has touched people all over the world because they left a value, an earthly kingdom value. Words of wisdom for dad, be an encourager. I think this is probably one of the most important. To be an encourager to your wife, to be an encourager to your children. To be an encourager is to reassure your children. My mother and dad told us often, I love you. In fact, as I grew older, there wasn't a time where we met and said the words and when we left, whether it was telephone, in person, we always said, I love you. My dad told me many times, I'm proud of you. Mother as well. To be an encourager means to inspire your children. To inspire them with the words that we speak, with the way we conduct our lives. To inspire them in our relationship with the Lord. One of the things that I, we're planning on as we return back in our children's ministry and students' ministry is that we would all gather together in worship so that our children could see their moms and dads worshiping God, lifting up holy hands and praising and glorifying the name of Jesus. That that, and not only their mothers and fathers, but their, but their uh, friends and relatives, that the body of Christ would also be an inspiration into their life, that we would sow into their life. To be an encourager also means to support them to support their dreams, to support their aspirations. Not to bail them out, but to occasionally let them fail and help them get back up again. To support them, to let them know that, son, daughter, I will always be there for you. Always be there. I will always do my best for you. And finally, to be an encourager means to nurture your children, to train them, to, to develop the godliness within them, to develop, to, to nurture that relationship with the Lord, not only as they see you, but as their own personal relationship with God. It is as though we would say to our children, come walk with me as we walk with God. And knowing that if we raise our children in the way that they will go, the Bible says that God will attend to them faithfully for the rest of their lives. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 says, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Dad, make it your point to encourage not only your children, but your spouse every single day. Word of wisdom, Dad, be joyful. You know, it doesn't hurt to smile. <laughs> It does, in fact, it takes less to smile than it does to frown. And there is so much to be joyful for and joyful in, to be pleasant, to be pleased, to just be happy. In fact, I've often said this, and I believe this with all of my heart, we serve a happy God. We serve a joyful God. For the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, if his joy is my strength, he has to have joy. And I believe he has an abundant, overflowing joy every single day. And, and Dad, can I just tell you, and I, I know sometimes this is a great challenge, don't take life so seriously. Find something to enjoy. Find something to laugh about every single day. An Irish proverb says, bricks and mortar make a house, but the laughter of children make a home. And I might add, not only the laughter of children, but the laughter of the dad, the father. My dad had a, many of you know my dad, but few of you know my dad's sense of humor. My dad and I share the same sense of humor. 
My dad and I can find things to laugh about that nobody else would laugh about. In fact, many times we would sit at the dinner table and something we said or something someone else said would cause us to go off into a tirade about something and we would just laugh and laugh and laugh. And my mother would sit at the table and often she would say, I don't find anything funny about that at all. I don't see anything humorous about that. But dad and I, we laughed, we continued to go on. And it wouldn't take much to tickle our funny bone. I loved my dad's laugh. I loved to see my dad laughing. And when he laughed, his whole being rejoiced. Well, Dad, I think that's important that our children seeing us happy. See us happy. And when our children see us happy, when our spouse sees us happy, then they know others' well, life is full of joy. And I can find that joy just as my daddy found that joy as well. Psalms 126 verse 3 says, When the Lord brought the prisoners back from Jerusalem, it seemed as if we were dreaming. And then we were filled with laughter and we sang happy songs. Then the other nations said, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we were very, very glad. Praise the Lord. Be joyful. Don't take life so seriously. Sometimes you've got to look for something to laugh about. You've got to look for something to smile about. But when you put a smile on your face, that smile is contagious. When you laugh, that laughter is contagious. And life is just a whole lot better when we can find something to be joyful in and for. Word of wisdoms for dad, number five, invest in your children. The greatest investment you will make is not in the stock market. The greatest investment you will make is not in the things you can buy and hold for future. The greatest investment you will ever make in your life is to invest in the lives of your children. Each and every one of them, knowing that all of our children are unique and they're different and it takes different things, it takes different time to make that investment. But I want you to hear me, and this is so vital, Often that investment in our children equals time. T-I-M-E. Giving our children, giving our spouse our time. Time is one of the most valuable commodities that there, are, that there is on the face of the earth today. In fact, there are many people that are willing to give money. There are many people that would give possessions, but not willing to give their time. Dad, when you give your children time, I remember years ago when James was really small, just a little toddler, and I was in the living room and I had the newspaper out. That was back in the day when we actually read the newspaper. I had the newspaper out and I was reading it and James wanted to talk to me. And, and he was just talking away and I looked over him and nodded and went back to the newspaper and every once in a while I'd look over him and nod and eventually I felt this little hand come over the very middle of the paper and pull the paper down. And James took my face, his hand in both of my cheeks, and he made me look him straight in the eye. How valuable that was to my son. That I would take time to give him my time. To give him my time. And, you know, each of our children being unique requires different parts or what is called in our time to do. Sometimes time to listen, sometimes time to play. And can I tell you this, Dad, for those of us that have children and older adults and then grandchildren even, there are some things I wish I could go back and do again. There's some things I wish I could say again. There's some things I wish I'd given less time to things that now I see were unimportant or less important and, and give time to my child to my grandchildren. My dad, years ago, when I played football, I, I had played several positions. I played uh, end and split end, and I also played cornerback on defense. And when I first started playing football, the coach once day asked us, who will, uh, we need somebody to center the, the ball for the punter and for the field goal kicker. Who will do that? And I raised my hand. Well, I learned very quickly that you don't volunteer for some things. I raised my hand and coach said, okay, Banny, you're gonna do it. And so we, we rehearsed and practiced, but we never practiced the art of 
centering the ball to the place field goal kicker or the punter. Never did that. We came to a new game. It was like a movie. We came into a game, and the game we were behind by one point, I think, and we were, it was the last seconds of the game. We were close to the, to the goal line, and coach called for the field goal team to go out. And so I ran out, and I ran out and had never rehearsed, never practiced, never done it in my life. I guess the coach assumed I had. And so got down over the football, and the placeholder gave me the signal, and I didn't do anything. He gave me the signal again, and I didn't do anything. And finally, he gave me the signal with, with, with great gusto, and I, I hiked that ball back. Oh, did I hike that ball back. About 30 yards right over his head. We lost the game. When it was over, the coach was livid with me. Again, I suppose he thought I knew what I was doing. All of the team thought that I had lost the game. I personally, myself, lost that entire game. When I walked off the field, dejected, got on my clothes, went back to my house, went into the house, slammed the door behind me, and my dad said, how was the game? Now I don't want to talk about it. Went into my room, closed the door, laid on the bed, and just fumed, embarrassed, and just fumed. Finally, I heard a knock on the door. My dad came in. He said, uh, Steve, what happened? I said, I want to talk about it. He said, no, we need to talk about it. What happened? And I conveyed the whole story to him. And, and I told him, I said, Dad, we never rehearsed that. We never practiced that. It was something we didn't practice on the field. So I did my... Dad asked me a question, a vital question. I will never, ever forget this. And I've asked this question of myself many times and of my son and my grandson many times. My dad asked me this question. He said, Steve, did you do your best? I said, yes, sir. I did my best. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was my best. And my dad spoke these words, and this is what I'll never forget. He said, then, son, we will work to make your best better. With that, every day after football practice, we would go into the backyard, and my dad would get down on, his, on one knee and like he was the placeholder and give me the signal, and we would go back and forth and back and forth. There'd be times it'd be way over his head, and he'd run and get the ball, come back down, and we rehearsed for hours. And we did this for days. We did this for weeks. Not because my dad demanded that we do, but because I wanted to. What was so valuable about that, by the way, just to let you know, I, for punts and field goals, I could thread the needle with that football. In fact, I could do it so well that they, they couldn't even handle it so hard I could get it. And that wasn't really the issue, obviously. But, but why could I do that? How could I do that? Because my dad gave me time. Gave me his time. I will never, ever, ever forget that moment, nor will I ever forget those words. Son, we'll work to make your best better. And with my dad's help, we did. And that became my job after that. For the days that I played football, I had to do it. Not that I wanted to, but I could do it. And I could do it well because my dad gave me his time. Dad, I think sometimes the most valuable thing we can do is invest our time in our children's lives. Mark chapter 9, verse 22, and 24, 22 through 24 in the message version said, Jesus said, if, there are no ifs among believers, anything can happen. No sooner were those words out of his mouth that the father cried, then I believe. Help me with my doubts. Another translation says, I believe, but help my unbelief. That, that, that we would be willing to say, I'll do it. If, if it's only five minutes, there are some dads that are working two jobs and three jobs. There are, there are dads that are working nights and evenings. It, it can be a great challenge. But if we'll invest in our children with the idea not that they will be like us, dads, but they will exceed anything we could ever do or even imagine to do on our own. There are no ifs among believers. Anything can happen. An unknown author wrote these words. One night my father overheard his one night a father overheard his son pray, "Dear God, make me the kind of man my daddy is." Later that night the father prayed, "Dear God, make me the kind of man my son wants me to be. I know that resonates within your heart as well. 
And I want you to know that God is for you. And God is with you. And God will strengthen you. Dad, sometimes we're just weak. Sometimes we just don't know what to do. And sometimes we do the wrong thing. But I want you to know this. God is at work within your life. God will never give up on you, Dad. Never. And when you fail, when you stumble, God will be right there to pick you up and give you strength as you have never known before. So words of wisdom for Dad. Number one, be the example. Number two, set the values. Not earthly values, but kingdom values. Number three, be an encourager for your children. Number four, be joyful. Find joy in your heart every day. And number five, invest in your children. Give them your time. I want to offer a word of prayer. But before I do, I want to read a scripture. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 31. And here's what the word says. Surely you know, surely you have heard. The Lord is the God who lives forever, who created all the world. He does not become tired or need to rest. No one can understand how great his wisdom is. Verse 29. He gives strength to those who are tired and more power to those who are weak. Dad, you may feel that way right now, or maybe not, maybe some other day. But take these words to heart, verse 29. He gives strength to those who are tired and more power to those who are weak. Verse 30. Even children become tired and need rest, and young people trip and fall. But the people who trust the Lord will become strong again. They will rise up as an eagle in the sky. They will run and not need rest. And they will walk and not become tired. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we give you thanks. I thank you for every dad. Not only the dads of Brazewood, but every dad who is watching this today. That on this Father's Day or any day, I pray that you will strengthen and encourage and undergird every dad, every father. That in our weakness, you will make us strong. And when we're weary and tired, you will raise us up. And that, Father, when we feel like stopping, when we feel like we've done our best and it's just not good enough, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be our encourager. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless every family represented here. Bless us beyond our desire. Bless us beyond our abilities. Bless us beyond our worthiness. For you are our Heavenly Father. Thank you that we, being your children, will lack no good thing. And that every father, every father will be a brilliant, shining light to their children. And we ask these things, blessing upon every father, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, dads. So grateful for what God is and will do in your life. Several announcements that I want to make. For those of you online, just to remind you that here at Fondren Campus and Hispanic Campus, we have a 9 o'clock service for those that are over 60 and 11 o'clock service for those that are under 60 years of age. And I also want to make this announcement the students, junior high and senior high students, are welcome to return in the 11 o'clock worship service. So if you've got junior high and senior high school students, bring them with you into the service. No children's ministry or student ministry. We're all here in the sanctuary. And face masks and social distancing, of course, is required. Now at Branch Forest, there's one service. That's at 11 o'clock for worshipers under 60 years of age. And again... Students, junior high and senior high school students are welcome, in fact, invited to attend. And again, there's no children's ministry or student ministries as well. And face masks and social distancing is required. And of course, Wednesday night and Thursday night services will be online only at 7 p.m. through the month of June. I want to encourage you to join with us on Wednesday night and Thursday night encounter online at Brazewood Church. Also, our 1252 initiative is so vital and important, and especially in this day where there's such volatility in our nation, hurt and pain and anguish, that we would be those that would call to encourage. There's a lot of, lot of needs in this country, a lot of things that need to change. But one thing is sure, 
Our God loves everyone and has joy to flood every heart. Be that encourager. 1, 2, 52. If every one of 1,500 people will contact two people a week for 52 weeks, we will have encouraged and blessed 156,000 people. And also, remember the soul goal, that we would pray for those in our maximum impact environment who do not know the Lord as their Savior, praying that God will bring revelation to their life. And then finally, on June the 28th, the last Sunday of June, we're going to be doing something very special here at Brazewood. We're going to be praying for law enforcement officers. Now, I think this is very important. There are, as we have seen and witnessed, with the killing of George Floyd and some of the things that have transpired in the last two weeks, there are police officers that should not be police officers. But I might add, there are teachers that should not be teachers, and there are pastors that should not be pastors. But for those who are conscientious, those who are our protectors, those who care about the people that they're serving, we want to pray for them. We want to pray that God will give them safety. We want to pray that God will give them the ability to stand up and say when something's wrong and stand up and say when something's right. We want to pray that God will give them supernatural wisdom, His hand resting upon their life. So on June the 28th, we're going to be praying for all of our police officers, those in this church and those outside. We've invited precincts to come and officers to come as well. We're going to be praying praying that God will use them as men and women of righteousness for the righteous cause. Join with us on June the 28th. That's Sunday, June the 28th. Moment for our stewardship. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. Thank you that you trust God. And you demonstrate that trust not only by the words that are spoken, but by the acts of faith that back those words up every time. Our God is a God of abundance. God is a God of abundance. There is no lack in God's kingdom. Even when all of the world is suffering and still, God will still provide for his children. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 says, God can do anything. You know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, His Spirit deeply and gently working within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah in Jesus. Glory down all the generations. Glory through all millennial. Praise the Lord. Our God can do more than we could ask or even imagine. And I know many of us have vivid imaginations. As big as your imagination is, as, as, as expansive as your thoughts may be, God is bigger. God can provide more. Fear of the future makes people settle for things in the present that completely defy abundant life. So have no fear of the future. Have no fear of tomorrow because God holds your tomorrow in the palm of his hand in the security of his word and of his nature. Trust him. Regardless of what you're facing today, regardless of what you're going through or what you see around you, trust God. He is the God of abundance. For you see, our God is not a just enough God. Our God is a more than enough God. I want you to say it with me. Say this with me. I choose God's abundance. Say it with me. I choose God's abundance. And God will bless you abundantly. As we end this service, I have a word for you. I end every service with this word. It's one word followed by a thought. Here's the word. Relax. Relax. God is in control. Don, I love you. We pray God's favor and best in your life. Happy Father's Day. God bless you.